in, welcome in, welcome in, welcome in, welcome in. Let's get it started, you guys. I'm a little early. I just wanted to make sure my connection was going to be good for you guys. And um, I just wanted to make sure everything was good, make sure the devil ain't playing with us. You know what I'm saying? Like, make sure the devil isn't bothering us. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. I pray your night was well. I pray your morning is even better. And I pray after this video that your life will never be the same and you will find somebody named Jesus Christ and he's going to change your life. Thank you, guys. Welcome in, welcome in, welcome in. My nerves are everywhere and I'm never nervous. So welcome in. Um, before I even start, I'm going to say a prayer to decrease my nerves. So um, let me anoint my hands again with some oil really quick, you guys. Hi, welcome in. I'm going to say a prayer right now because my nerves are like everywhere for no reason at all other than this is my first Resurrection Sunday. Um, this is my first Resurrection Sunday. So... And I want to make sure you guys know, because if you follow me, then you know that we don't pay attention to the comments. We make sure we pay attention to the voice of God and who he, who, who, he who has ears, let him hear. So we don't need moderators. We need divine focus. So let the devil have his sex day over there. And we're going to focus on God because the devil is going to peek in and try to stop you from receiving your blessings by getting you distracted. And we don't play with the, we don't, we don't play with the devil. And today is Jesus' day. So I have anointed my hands and I'm going to begin to pray for myself and you guys so let's get this praying started <laughs> and all of a sudden all the airplanes want to fly over me <laughs> so spirit of the living god fall fresh on us i ask right now that you take away any nerves any fear any anything that makes me take away from your word father god none of me and all of you let me repeat it none of me and all of you father god today is a celebration it's not a morning it's a celebration because we know that jesus rose and he lives every day inside of us father god and i ask that whatever your will over our lives be done whatever we're praying for asking for hoping for believing for father god let it come into fruition according to your will and your purpose for our lives father god and Father God, right now, some of us are going to face opposition. The devil is going to try to rear his ugly head into the comments. And I ask right now that you have divine focus from your children, Father God. Let them not get distracted from the devil's tactics. He has no power here. He has no power over our lives. And no weapon formed against us shall prosper, Father God. Today is your son, Jesus Christ's day. And I pray to only represent him well and represent the kingdom of heaven well, Father God. So as for me, no nerves, no fear will seep into me and let me speak your word with no added or subtracted from it, Father God. Just substance from you and you alone. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. <laughs> All right. Okay, you guys. So this is gonna be, um, this is gonna be a good little word. It's gonna be very long. It's gonna be very saturated with verses. So, um, you guys bear with me but in order for me to tell you about the death of jesus i have to tell you about who he is so in order to do that i have to go back to john who paved the way for jesus christ himself john the baptist was the one the pioneer who spoke for jesus who paved the way he said he's not even you know adequate enough to touch the the, the lace of jesus sandals right so he he came through and he made a way for Jesus. And this is John's version of Jesus Christ. We know we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and all of those people who had, you know, their version. But I think the most powerful version that needs to be told is John the Baptist's version. He actually was in the belly with Jesus and they jumped out of their mother's womb and they played with each other before they were even born. They knew who they were. And as soon as he saw Jesus, no one had to say that was him, that was him. He saw him and he knew that that was the man who was in the belly with him and they were playing tag in each other's belly like he knew who Jesus was right and he paved the way for Jesus to come along and this is his version of who Jesus was and how he lived and how he ultimately died and then rose again for us and this is in his way so I'm gonna be in John the chapter of John and we're gonna dive in because John told a beautiful love and then rose again for us. And this is in his way. So I'm going to be in John, the chapter of John. And we're going to dive in because John told a beautiful love story. So I'm going to start. I'm actually going to name my father verses um, just in case you guys want to um, go ahead and try to follow along with me. But I will also um, post this on YouTube so you guys can come back and get some studies done. 
But in John, I'm going to be in the first chapter. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. And I'm going to skip over and go to 11 through 13. Skip over again and go to 23 through 24. And then I'm hit you with 29. I'm going to come back again. I'm going to hit 41 through 42. 45 through 47. And then I'm going to skip down to chapter 2. Chapter 2, I'm going to do verse 13 through 16. 18 through 23. And then I'm going to come down to chapter 3. <laughs> and in chapter 3, we're going to do 12 through 17. Then we're going to hit chapter 4, which is 31, 34 through 38, 48 and 40, 43 and 48. Then we're going to skip to chapter 5. I told you guys it's going to be lengthy. 1 through 17, and then verse 18, verse 28, 39 through 37. And then we're going to come down to chapter 6, 16 through 21. And then 35 through 40, 41 through 51, and 60 through 70. Chapter 7, verse 7, 16 through 18, 19 through 24, 32 through 47. And then we're going to hit chapter 8, um, verse 20, and then 22 to 29, 31, and then 38. And to close it off, well, we got a lot of chapters, guys. <laughs> so I hope y'all ready. Just know we're going to read. So, and as I'm reading, I'm not going to do a summation thing. I'm going to try to jump in while I'm reading, right? So, we're going to start in chapter 1. Okay, hold on, y'all. The wind is blowing my hair. Um, so, chapter 1, verse 1 is like, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made, uh, made through Him, and without Him was not anything made. Um, in his life and in the life of the light of men, the light shines through the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. So then we're going to go down to, um, I read it one through five, 11. We're going to do 11 through 13. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name he gave his right he gave the right to become the children of God who were born not of blood nor will nor the will of the flesh nor the will of man but God so John is just letting everybody know that Jesus was always in the beginning he was he was up there you know and if we believe in him we will have the light that shines in Jesus but we're gonna keep going because I'm not gonna get distracted right now with me breaking it down for y'all I'm gonna break it down in one second so 23 through 24, and it says, He said, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. And this was him talking about Jesus. He said, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. You know, and it takes me back to Revelations. And I don't want to get distracted about this. But, you know, when she pushed out the baby running away from the dragon, they had went to a sacred place in the wilderness God had prepared for them. And so we're not going to go there because that's going to be a whole different top topic. So 29, 29, y'all. The day he saw Jesus coming towards him, he said, Behold, the blood of the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Now, he hasn't seen Jesus since he leaped in his mother's belly. But he instantly knew who Jesus was when he saw him. And what did he say as soon as he saw him? Behold, the blood of the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. He knew who Jesus was and he knew the purpose of Jesus. He had been paving the way for Jesus this whole time, baptizing people in the name of Jesus. He had been speaking to everyone about this man named Jesus who can save anybody. And I know the son back in the day, I'm just nobody trying to tell anybody about somebody that can save anybody. Because John the Baptist was literally going through baptizing people in the name of Jesus Christ, his Lord and Savior, who came to save everybody who came to die for your sins he who had no sins came to take on your sins so you can live abundantly listen jesus was the ultimate sacrifice if you want to know what love is jesus was all of that so we're going to come over again to 41 to 42 okay he found he first found his own brother simon and simon said to him we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. 
you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So Jesus was showing how he could be a name changer. This man who didn't know Jesus was brought to Jesus and he looked at him like, oh, your name Simon? Oh, okay, no. You are the son of John, Cephas, but I'm going to call you Peter. Jesus was changing people's name that they didn't even know Jesus, but they knew Jesus. You know how you know somebody, but you don't know them because you can feel that spirit in him. He could have been like, you don't know me. How are you going to change my name? But he felt the spirit of Jesus and he knew the spirit of God that was in him. And he was like, change me, change me. You've been hearing about this man named Jesus and you know that he could be a name changer. And when the right person who has the spirit of God in them walks up to you and say, this is going to be who you are. You believe it because you know that this is the Lord speaking to you. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. You know that this is him speaking to you. So that was just him, you know, showing his power, but not even really showing his power, you know. So we're going to go to 45 through 47. Um, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of, of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Hmm. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Because they're so busy looking at where he comes from and who he was born to physically that they didn't even know that they were standing in front of the messiah himself see people are so busy trying to convict you can anything good come out of the hood out of the projects from a from an addicted parent from a bandit child from an orphanage from an adoption from a fostering can anything good come out of that can anything good come out of that but you're like, I believe God. And if I don't forgive my unbelief and everyone is looking at you and you're washed in the blood of Jesus and you're washed and you're made new and everyone's saying, can anything good come out of that? And Jesus is like, you don't know who my father is. You don't know who the blood of the lamb is. You're speaking to me and you're not even know who you're speaking to. You're entertaining a, a child of God and don't even know who you're entertaining. You're doubting who God says I am. And they're saying, can anything good come out of the hood? Can anything good come out of this addictive personality, this, this fornicator? Can anything good come out of this abandoned child at birth? No mother, no father, this crack addicted baby, this hair run addicted baby. Can anything good come out of this? Yes. Yes. Yes is that answer. They doubted who Jesus was. And you don't think that they doubt who you is, who you are? They're going to doubt you time and time and time again because they don't believe in themselves. Had they believed in themselves, they would have believed in Jesus because they knew that God was there. Jesus knew who he was and he didn't care who they thought he was. And he didn't care to answer them when they, when they questioned him time and time and time again. And I don't need you to question when they go to question you when you make it to the top. And they say, you come from the projects. You can come out of me. And my t test is going to be my testimony. Come on. Come on. Come on. Y'all run with me to chapter two real quick. Come on. Come on. Because they doubt who you are and they doubted Jesus too. Don't get sad. Don't get emotional because your very own city won't believe you. Don't worry. They didn't believe Jesus, but don't worry. Let them sleep. Let them sleep on you, baby. Let them sleep because just like Jesus resurrected, so will you. And still you will rise. And still you will rise. Okay, chapter two. We're going to come to chapter two. 13 through 16, y'all. Okay. 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and when Jesus went up to Jerusalem, in the temple he found those who were selling oxen, sheep, and pigeons, and the money ch money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he dove, he drove them out with, of the temple with a sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins and money changers and overturned the tables. And those who sold pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered um, that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. That's it through 16. Okay. So he get into the, the temple where the Pharisees and all of them were because they thought they were better than everyone. And this is the common church. Inside the church, they were doing everything but praising God. Inside the church, he found no one in there praying, praying and giving sacrifices and having obedience for God. When he got into the temple that they made holy, what they called were holy, 
he saw that they were making it a house of sin. And he went in and he'd overturn everything. And this is happening with the coming church. This is why so many people are turning away. Because they're making the house of God unholy. They're making it a house of trade. Where if you don't sow a seed of 25 and sow a seed of 35 and sow a seed of 150. And if you don't give them everything but your soul, then you're not made holy. Nothing holy was inside of that church. Let me break down ties for you right now. Tithes is the first 10% of your offering that you get in the beginning of the month. You give up your best fruits to God. You give up your best fruits. And throughout the month, if you want to continue to sow into God's church or into God's ministry or whatever it is, you can do so. But it's giving up anything to God. You can sow a seed to a homeless person on the side of the road. You can sow a seed by doing something good for someone. You can sow a seed by speaking life into someone. You don't always have to give money when it comes to giving God your tithes and offerings. We don't need your money. Your money isn't for the church. Your money is for God to show your obedience. It is you showing God your obedience. What they're doing with the church and what they're doing with the money is they're making their life lavish and not taking care of God's children. They're not taking care of the homeless out here in the streets. They're not going out here and, and sowing into people's lives and helping people out in the community and this is why God said I am coming through and I'm going to overturn everything because I'm not there I'm not there he says you guys have been sowing into 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 unleavened ground the ground isn't good and that's why you haven't been seeing fruitful seeds and God says when you find the people that are of me and you start sowing into good ground there you will find me but make no mistake about it. Nothing you sown will be um will be um void. He saw everything because you were still obeying what he told you to do. He will deal with the common church and what they're doing to you. But you continue to be obedient. But going forward, have wisdom in what you're doing. Okay. So we're gonna go to chap um, chapter two, eighteen through twenty three. Eighteen. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show? For us saying these things. Jesus answered. Destroy this temple. And in three days. I will raise it up. The Jews then said. It has taken 46 years to build up this temple. And you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple. About the temple of his body. When therefore he would raise from the dead. His disciple remembered that he had said these things. And they believed the scripture. And the word that Jesus had spoken. See, they were thinking about a physical thing. They're thinking, it took us 46 years to build this temple. How dare you come in saying you would break it down in one in, in three days and rebuild it? And Jesus was like, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection. I am. You're standing in front of the great I am and don't even know it. You have this house being a house of trade. And you don't even know the Messiah that is standing in front of you itself. You don't even know the company that you entertain. Yes, I will die in three days and I will rise up and I will destroy every last one of you. And I will still live again. You may take my physical body, but I'm not flesh anyway. I come from a higher power anyway. You can take this body. You can take this body. You can pierce the side. You can do whatever you want to do to this body. Because in three days, I will reign again and my reign will be forever. They didn't know who they were speaking to, but in due season, they knew. Hmm. And Jesus was speaking before he even died because he knew who he was and he knew who his God was. Come on. Listen. Mm. Listen. He already knew who he was. He already knew who he was. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be. How can you believe in something that you can't see if I'm standing right here and you see me? yet you don't see me and i'm going to talk to the black sheep really quick i'm going to talk to the black sheep really quick because you're like how now can you see me when before you didn't see me how now can you see me when i've been in your whole household for 36 years 35 years 23 years i've been in the house the whole time and you never saw me and now you try to believe and now Jesus said, how can you tell them heavenly things if they don't see you now? But black sheep, understand me. You will rise up. You will rise up. Jesus is in you, and this is your season, and he's about to make your name great. Okay, all right, okay, I'm not going to get there. We're going to go to chapter 4. We're going to go to chapter 4. Mm. 
we're gonna go to chapter four and i'm gonna hit 31 where is it where is it mm. meanwhile the disciples were urging him saying rabbi eat he said to them i have food to eat that you know nothing about so his age is for gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together for he for here is saying true holds true one sows another reaps i have sent you to reap that which you do not labor others have labored and you have entered into their labor what he was saying is they were reaping a harvest because the work of Moses before him, Abraham before him, all of the sentence before him, and now Jesus is coming to finish it off. Yet and still, we will reap the harvest of Jesus' labor. Jesus came to die for our sins. He took on our sins. He who had no sins took on our sins, and we are now reaping the harvest of Jesus Christ himself. And not only Jesus, but Moses and everyone before him. They all paved the way for us to sit here now before him before Jesus listen Jesus already paved the way his life was a living testament but if we want to go back to Moses even though Moses was frustrated with every last one of them Moses was the Moses was <laughs> Moses was sick of everybody <laughs> When I think of Moses, I think of Moses and his frustration. Moses is you telling your child over and over again until you get done. And you like, you know what? Square up. Moses was sick of everything and everybody. He told G he told God, these are your people. I don't want these people. These uncircumcised Philistines, these uncircumcised Israelites. He was sick of everything and everyone. Moses had had enough with everyone and everybody. When I tell you, when I read, read the book of Moses, I laugh every single time because he was sick of them. He was arguing back and forth with God. He's like one of the only people that can argue back and forth with God, telling him, these your people. I don't want them. I don't want them. <laughs> <laughs> when I think about Moses, he was he was done. He was done. And he was like, put me on this cloud and get me up out of here. Because I don't I don't even want to go into the land of milk and honey. I just want to come up here to heaven with you. I done gave these people laws. They breaking the laws. You can move someone out of an environment. But if they don't change their mentality, they're never going to get it. And when I think about the Israelites coming out of Egypt, Egypt, right? out of slavery they were still in bondage mentally they could never get that they were free and they kept thinking that Moses was trying to betray them and he was trying to abandon them and so because they did not change their mentality they were not they were not allowed to get into the promised land even though they were free they were still enslaved mentally and so Moses didn't understand because he was free and he knew he was free. He was free and he was done. And he didn't understand and he didn't have the patience like Jesus had the patience to sit with them. Because they betrayed Jesus time and time again. But Jesus had the patience and he knew that they just did not get it. Because if you're not free mentally, you're never going to be free. You can get up there and have multi-millions of dollars. But you're enslaved by your mind because you have not yet gotten to that next level. Because you still think that you're a slave. You still think you're from the poverty you still think that you're from the hood you still think that you are addicted if you do not change your mind you're going to sabotage everything and everybody that god sent to deliver you and that's what happened with the egyptians um so yeah bring y'all back to bring y'all back <laughs> um so i'm gonna go to 43 really quick in chapter three still y'all after two days he departed from galilee for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. You will never have honor in your own town. When you make it to be successful. Okay, let's say I'm from Gainesville. Well, my family originated from Apalachicola and then moved to Daytona. And so I was born here. So I'm from Gainesville, Florida. And here we have mega churches. We have mega churches that probably will never let me speak in them. That's fine. Because you have no honor in your hometown. But let's say I make it to the Sarah Jakes level, the T.D. The Jakes level. Let's say I make it to the top or something like that. People then will start seeing, I know her. I know them. I know them. I, You know, people will start saying, you will have cousins that come out of the woodworks that live next to you that never once sold into your ministry. That never once heard your, heard your voice. And never once shared your stuff. You will have people that will come out of the woodworks to testify about how they known you. But had they start sharing your stuff and had they start helping you and, and knowing who you were and helping getting your name out of there, you know, you would you would went further. But that's not the way that God wants you to anyway, because it is written 
that you have no honor in your hometown anyway. They didn't recognize Jesus himself when he went there. Jesus could do very few miracles in his own hometown. I can do very few things in my hometown. They don't recognize me as a woman of God. They don't recognize me as a pastor of God. But it's not, it's not for me to, to try to make them because I have no honor in my hometown. When God moves me, he will elevate me. And then they will come along and they will say, I once knew a woman called Pastor Lindaria Watts, you know. But don't hold, don't hold hate when your family and friends and loved ones don't see you. Because in due season, they will see the harvest that God has for you. And it will be plentiful. And don't hold hate and malice inside because they didn't see you. Maybe God had blinders on them for a reason because it's not time for you to be revealed to them yet. It's time for you to be revealed to the world and then they will see the goodness of God. Maybe they life maybe their life will be changed around because of who you are and you know you will start hearing more testimonies. So I need you not to harvest hate because people don't, you know, see you. It's okay. They didn't see Jesus and it didn't stop him from going to where he needs to get to, you know? So, we're going to go to chapter 5 really quick. And in chapter 5, we're going to go to um, 1 through 7. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool, um, in an ar aromatic called Bethsaida, which he had, which has five roofs, right, five roofs, right? In these lay a multitude of individuals, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an in invalid for 38 years, who was like paralyzed for 38 years. When, he saw, when Jesus saw him lying there and he knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you wish to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool. When the water is stirred up and while I am going, another steps before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now this, now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is a Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered to them, the man said, he who has healed me, um, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They said to him, who is this man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who he was, for Jesus had withdrawn and there was a crowd in his place. Afterwards, Jesus found the temple and there he said, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered to them, my father is working until now and I am working. This is when the Jews were seeking him, was seeking all more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. What they did not know was Jesus was sent from God. I don't even want to say what they did not know. I want to say they knew. Just like the man that was blind not blind but paralyzed knew who jesus was he didn't know jesus name but he knew that he was sent from god he knew that he was a healer he knew that he was a miracle worker they knew who jesus was but they knew that he was going to be powerful and my mom my mom has this saying a scary person will kill you they had fear that jesus was going to be more powerful than them so then they said to, they sought to kill Jesus, not because he broke the law of the Sabbath day, because they knew that someone greater than them was going to walk around and was going to have more weight on their name than them. So they can't stand the fact that they didn't have power and that a man spoke a word and that it was so. And the very gods that they were praying to in these, temp these temples and these synagogues and the very gods that they were praying to did not deliver them, were not answering their prayers, was not, you know, was not coming to them. And just because this man said a word, it was so. And they've been speaking words to the people for time and time and time, yet nothing came into fruition because God was never in them. And because God was not in them, everything that they said had no weight to it, so it was all void. And because the power of the weight of God's words was in Jesus, it was so. 
That's why life and death is in the power of the tongue. And that's why the devil seeks to shut you up. Even when you're in businesses and in jobs and corporations, when you work in corporations, you can't say what you need to say and people run around. And even in politics, you can't say, I don't vote for this person. I don't go for this because they will turn it around on you because of a word, because they know the word, the weight that your words carry. And just like they, they, they sent to silence Jesus up, it's in the power of your tongue. Life and death is in the power of your tongue. Listen, they wanted to shut Jesus up so bad. They wanted to shut him up so bad because they feared what would happen if his word would get around. Mm. Excuse me, y'all. Excuse me. Mm. Listen. The devil ain't going to get me today. The devil not going to get me today. So we're going to come over. And I think this is. I think this is my favorite one. The one I'm about to read right now. Where I'm at in chapter 6. 16 through 21. This is my favorite. So I'm in chapter 6. 16 through 21. When the evening came. His disciples went to the sea got into the boat and started across the sea of um Shepriam. i mess it up y'all y'all know it it was dark now and jesus had not yet come to them then the sea became rough and a strong wind was blowing when he when they had rowed out about three or four miles they saw jesus walking on the sea coming near to the boat and they were frightened but he said to them it is i do not be afraid then they were glad to take him in the boat and immediately the boat was at the land which they were going listen i don't think y'all caught that it said immediately when he got on the boat they got into land there was a storm raging there was a storm raging they were three or four miles out they just began to get on their journey and soon as Jesus walked on the water to come to that boat, immediately they got to their place. When Jesus, when you allow Jesus into your life, when you see Jesus walking out there in the midst of your storm, all hell is breaking loose in your life, literally. All hell is breaking loose in your life. And you look out and you see Jesus walking to you. And at first you don't know what storm is coming to you. You just see this body walking and you're like, God, I don't know what's going on. I can't take another loss. What is this thing coming towards me? And they recognize that it was Jesus. When you recognize that in all of the chaos that the devil is trying to disguise, the kids acting up, the job acting up, the car acting up, the money acting up, you're losing everything. When you look up and you see something walking towards you, which is the son of man, Jesus Christ himself. When you look up and you say, Jesus, is that you? And you allow him into your body. When you allow Jesus into your life, immediately they got to their destination. Immediately the storm has to cease. Immediately God has to come into your life. Immediately they got to their location. They were supposed to be selling for a long time. But when they allowed Jesus to come into their life, when they allowed Jesus to come into that boat, they immediately got to their destination. Understand this. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God comes that you have, may have life and live abundantly. When they let Jesus into that boat, they immediately got to their destination. And God says, when you let Jesus Jesus in you're going to immediately get your um get your destiny fulfilled you're going to immediately start seeing miracle signs and wonder into your life listen God says I knock every day are you going to allow me to come into your life let me in says God let me in come on somebody come on Jesus, we're allowing you into our lives right now. We're allowing you into our lives because we know that the devil's chaos, panic, the devil's chaos that he's creating in our life is a panic attack because he knows that we are about to be somebody. And he knows that we are somebody and that we are about to walk into some of the greatest seasons of our lives and that the devil wants to come in and try to distract us and get us off, off, off focus. And the storms are blowing. The winds are blowing. Finances are going away. You were once plentiful and now everything is plundering your blank account was once sitting on swole and now you sitting on 299 and a wing and a prayer your car was working and now all of a sudden it's acting stupid your kids was doing good and all of a sudden they talking back looking at you like they want to square up and you looking like run up and get done up baby listen everything is happening your job is threatening to fire you people are turning against you family members are turning their back friends are turning against you you're getting lied on you're getting cheated on you don't know if you're going or coming the devil is coming go to take away everything away from you but god says what i told y'all you can take everything away 
but what you cannot do is touch my child. And immediately, Jesus got on that boat. The storm stopped, the wind stopped, the fear stopped, and they got to their destination. They got to their destination. And God says, let me in, let me in, and let me show you what I can do suddenly. Let me show you what I can do immediately when you allow me to come into your life. Listen, run up and get done up, devil. That's all I got to say. Okay, I'm not going to do the hood. I'm not doing hood version 101. Bring it back, Lynn. You classy today. <laughs> okay. Listen. So we're going to come up. <laughs> we're going to come over. I'm going to be. Uh-oh. Okay, okay. I think I'm going to still stay in 30. And chapter 6. You know what? I think I'm going to come out of there. Okay. So I think I'm going to come to chapter 7, and I'm going to start with verse 7. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify about it that works are in that the works are evil. You go up against a feast. I am not going up to the feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. And then I'm going to come over to 16 through 18 in chapter 7. So Jesus answered them, my, cheat, my teachings is not my teachings, but he who sent me. If anyone will, if anyone's will is to God, is God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. This is where false prophets and false teachings come in. Because if you know who God is, you know that we're not speaking on our own authority. It's when we add things and take things away from God's word is when we start messing up. Jesus never added anything and he never took anything away. He came solely to do the will of God. Only the will of God. And then we're going to come to um, 19 through 24. Has not Moses given you the law? My boy Moses. Yet none of them, none of you keep the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, you have a demon who is seeking to kill you. Jesus answered them, I did only one work and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision and not that, um, Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but it is from the fathers and you and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath, if if one if on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, so the letter of the brethren. They quickly said, when Jesus said, Why do you seek to kill me? They said, You have a demon, accusing Jesus to have a demon inside of him because he healed someone. Hmm, I'm confused. At what part of healing makes it demonic that a man that had been you know, down for what, 30 something years, not walking, not nothing, and y'all passing by him, not helping him. Y'all didn't even dip him in the pool of Bethesda. Y'all just passed by him. But when I come to deliver him, y'all have something to say about me delivering him. I'm confused of what part of that is demonic about me delivering a man and making his body well, and then telling him, you're healed, make sure you sin no more. I'm confused and baffled by what you guys are accusing me of. You're accusing me to have a demon inside that's seeking to kill me. Hmm, perhaps it's you who has legions of demons inside of you who are seeking to kill me. Or maybe it's you having envy inside of you who knows that you cannot be me or walk like me and talk like me. That's why you want to kill me because you can't be the very thing that you're pretending to be. You're pretending to deliver people in your churches. You're pretending to deliver people in your churches. You're pretending to be me. And now that I'm here, I am here in the flesh. You're mad. You're envious. You're, you're jealous of the person that I am. And you're trying to say that I am not who I am because you're trying to be who I am, but you could never be me. So now you're trying to persecute me for being the very person who I am because you can't be that person 
An envious person will kill you because they can't be you. They're fearful of you actually having the truth of God in you. And they were so mad that they couldn't be Jesus because all of those numb yo reggae kyo prayers that y'all doing up in the temple aren't really getting you the, the deliverance that is really that is really Jesus Christ himself. And I am I am the flesh and y'all are mad because I don't have to do none of that. I don't have to pray to no false God because I know who sent me down. And all I got to do is say a word. But now I got a demon in me because I'm not in there with my rosary beads praying to a God that don't exist saying numb yo rank eight kyo come down here and pray a blessings upon them or whatever kind of God y'all praying to and all I got to do is say get up get up and you are healed go and sin no more you're mad because it's the Sabbath day but Moses who created the law was doing circumcisions on this day and y'all did not persecute Moses. Y'all knew y'all knew for a fact that Ro Moses would have said, run up and get done up. Moses was about that life. You wouldn't go you wouldn't go question Moses, but you're gonna question me. Because you can't be me. And you never will, because you don't have the father inside of me. Listen. Listen. They're so mad and envious and hateful because they could not be Jesus Christ himself. They had plenty of opportunity. Jesus wasn't there first. Y'all were. Y'all y'all had all the opportunity to heal these people. Instead, y'all enforced taxes on them. Y'all enforced all of these codes of conduct on them. Y'all wasn't trying to heal them. Y'all put a pool out that was supposed to be for healing. But y'all wouldn't even put the people in the pool. Y'all let the people sit on the side of the pool. Y'all wouldn't even dip the people in. Y'all wouldn't even dip the people in so they could taste and see that the Lord is good. All these mega churches out here. All these homeless shelters in front of them. All these tents out here built in front of these mega churches when the hurricane came y'all wouldn't even let them in y'all locked up the churches instead of letting the people inside the nerve of you ungrateful heathens listen don't get me started y'all making his house a house of sin and jesus said you don't gotta get in their water i don't need their water to heal you they sit up there they watching they watching me right now but they gonna watch my god get his glory today they gonna watch my god get his glory today i'm gonna speak a word and I'm going to let them know that we don't need your funky behind water that called got healing in it. We don't need your holy water. I am the truth and the life. I am that I am. And I'm going to speak a word to you. And it's going to be so. I don't need your water. I don't need your temple. I don't need your blessing. All I need is the authority from God himself. And since he's in me, all I got to do is speak a word and let it be so. I don't need nothing from you, devil. We don't make deals with the devil. Get thee behind me, Satan. Go and sin no more. You're mad because of a day. And I'm telling you that I am the resurrection and the life. Come on. Y'all ain't finna get me fired up. We got a long way to go. <laughs> listen. They was mad, baby. They was mad. Mm. So listen. They sent people, right? What, baby? You almost said. Mm. Go in the house. They sent people to arrest Jesus, right? They sent people to arrest Jesus. And the very people that they sent could not arrest Jesus. They said, we've never heard someone speak like he spoke before. Even the, even the accusers who send out people to arrest you, when they see the good works that you have done, when they hear the word of the Lord that you have, they will be arrested in their spirit and they can't put their hands on you. Because they know what it is to walk with God. And they know when they hear. Because he who has ears let him hear. They know that God is in you. Come on. They couldn't, they couldn't touch Jesus. They couldn't have touched Jesus. Listen. I'm going to come over here. I'm going to come over here. Really quick. Because I'm going to come over to. Um, chapter 12. And we're going to go to chapter 12 and we're going to go to verse 3. Because everybody has a divine purpose that they have to fulfill, right? And everything has to get fulfilled. So, I said chapter 12 and we're going to do 3 through 7 in chapter 12. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of her perfume. But Jesus, uh, Judas, um, Judas of the disciples, he was the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this anointment, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? 
He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was the thief and having charge of the money bag, he used it to help himself what was put in it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep, keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have, you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. And I had wrote in side notes about Judas, right? Because we all have to have a Judas to get us to our next level. We all have to be betrayed in order to elevate. And I know it sounds kind of heartless, but how else are your, how are you going to be sitting at the table that's going to be prepared for you in the presence of your enemies, right? So when I think about Judas, who played a pivotal part in the Bible, right? In the, in the pivotal part of the Bible, Judas had already had to, had to play his part. And people say that, you know, they want to put their fleshly version on it. And I don't want to read in between the lines when it comes to Judas. Everybody has a divine purpose in life. Jesus had a purpose to come down and die for our sins so we would be born again, right? Judas had a purpose too. And everyone was like, he felt so bad and he really didn't want to do it. He No, 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 no. From the day Judas was born, he had a divine purpose. And so does your enemies. Everyone in your life has a divine purpose. Your enemies are, uh, nothing is by chance but God. Judas's very name means traitor. That's the definition of Judas' name. It means traitor. By birth, he had a name placed upon him. His name was traitor. He betrayed everybody that was around him. He was a thief. He was a liar. He was, he, that's who he was by birth. By his birthright, this is who he was. He had a sole purpose on this earth. And once your purpose is fulfilled in life, you, were, you it was what it was. He hung himself in the end. His purpose was to solely let, G, let, let Satan enter him and do his will. He let the devil use him. He betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, even though he walked with Jesus. He saw Jesus. If he really wanted money, he knew Jesus could walk over to the water, grab a fish out, and get money right out of it to pay a tax collector, to tax collector or whatever it is, right? He knew who Jesus was. He'd been with Jesus. He walked with Jesus, and he seen the miracle signs and wonders. Yet and still, he had his own purpose to fulfill. That's who Jesus was. He was a thief. He was greedy. He, he was fearful of Jesus. He was insecure because Jesus had all of this notoriety. He saw all of this. He saw Jesus flip the, ter the tables over. And I think when he saw the tables being flipped over in the church, I think he knew that then he was going to get exposed. He knew that, his, he, knew that he wasn't going to hide behind Jesus for a long time. That's why when they sat at the table and they were breaking the bread and Jesus said, one of you are sitting here are going to betray me. And he handed Judas his personal piece of bread. And then he disappeared in the night. He then went and betrayed Jesus at that time. It said Satan entered into him satan entered into judas and he knew that he had to go betray jesus and once the betrayal was done he tried to stop it but his purpose was fulfilled and once your purpose is fulfilled your enemies see when they see you about to elevate to your next level they're going to want to be like oh no it was too soon no it was right on time you betrayed me right on time you did what you did right on time because because you betrayed me now god is about to get his full glory Jesus rose in three days. It had to happen. The betrayal has to happen. Everyone in your life, even though it hurts, even though it hurts you to your core, it has to happen. And you're like, I wouldn't do them like this. No, because that's not your purpose. Your purpose is to work kingdom God's business. That's not your purpose. So you will never understand a snake's purpose because you're not a snake. You're not an envious, jealous snake. You would never understand their purpose because it's not your purpose to understand. It's theirs. Their purpose is to let the devil come inside of them to use them and then elevate you to the next level. Had they known, had Judas known that Jesus was going to get all the glory, he would not have done it because he can't stand to see Jesus rise. And your enemies, had they known that them betraying you was going to elevate you, they would never betray you. They will continue to be the sneaky snakes that they are. If they knew that their betrayal is your glorification, your, your elevation, they would not do it because they don't want to see you rise. But they have a purpose to fulfill and it will get done. Nothing is by chance with God. It was not by chance that Judas was going to betray Jesus. It is not by chance that your enemies are betraying you. It is not by chance that your friend slept with your husband. Your friend slept with your man. It, is not your, it was not by chance that that happened. Because from that, you left them and you walked into your kingdom marriage. You would not have left had that not been done. It is not by chance that you got betrayed by somebody at your job. And then you end up getting fired. And God elevated you to the next level. It is not by chance that one of the rent owners lied on you. And said you didn't pay your rent. Even though you got all the receipts. And you got a false 
eviction. Now you get your better house. It is not by chance that all of this stuff happened. Nothing is by chance that the betrayers do what they do best because they're going to do it and they're going to do it well. But one thing God is going to do, he's going to elevate you and he's going to elevate you well. Listen, it is not by chance. Nothing is by chance. You're going to get the glory because God is going to get the glory. Everything is by divine design. They have to do what they have to do. And I need you to stop wondering why, why, why. You would never understand why because you are not a betrayer. You are not a snake. You are not a Judas. Your name does not equate with um, a, a traitor. My name is Lindaria Watts. Watts is light. I make light happen. That, that was Judas, which equals traitor. Everyone has a divine destiny they have to get to. Listen, they all have a purpose. And I need you to stop wondering why someone is betraying you. And understand that they have a purpose to be fulfilled. And once that purpose is fulfilled, they have to do what has to. And you know, Judas hung himself. I know they want to have sympathy for Judas, but I don't. It had to happen. It had to happen. Your betrayers had to betray you. Listen, it all had to happen. It all had to happen. Okay. It all had to happen. Okay. So, um, I want to go to, hold on. Y'all, excuse my neighbors. I stay in the ghetto. <laughs> so it might get a little rowdy, but if I go inside, we're going to lose connection and we ain't on that this season. Um, where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we going? I'm going to go to Luke for a second and 22 because I really, really, really want to go. To, maybe I'll go to 19. Hold on, y'all. 19 and then I said 9 through 11. 9 through 11. Actually, I'm going to stay right here in John 19. I'm going to stay on um, 9 through 11. He entered into the headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So the Pilatus said to him, You will not speak to me. Do you know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you have no authority over me unless it had began, be, been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you is greater than sin. What he's saying is your enemies think they have you trapped. And they're telling you that, you know, I can, I can fire you right now. You know, I can steal your man right now. You know, I can steal your wife right now. You know, I can still, you know, I can repossess your car. You know, you don't own this house. I can take this house. You know, you don't own your money. I can take that. You ain't got no authority over nothing. And Jesus simply said, you have no authority over me unless given to you by God. The enemy is coming in because the illusionist that he is and trying to tell you that he has authority over you and he does not. He has no authority. He has no power. He has no dominion. When God made man, he gave us dominion over everything in this earth. The devil has no power, no authority, no right over God's people. He has to get his hands off of God's people. And Jesus was saying them, saying to them, if I wanted to, I can get out of this right now. I can kill you right now. I can destroy you right now. I can speak a word over you and it'll be so right now. But God has me, it, has, it all had a purpose. Jesus had to go through what he had to go through. But the devil is coming in to try to act as if he has authority. But Jesus is like, let me let, me let you in on the secret real quick because you trying to punk fake me and I ain't on that. You have no authority over me unless it was given to you and to God. And because you don't even know who God is, you don't even have authority over yourself. Listen, don't let them, don't let them scare you because you fear nothing but God. They're trying to take away your job. They're trying to tell you they about to steal your man, your woman. That ain't mine in the first place. If you can have them, take them. Because that means my kingdom husband coming in. My kingdom wife coming in. Do, what, do your worst, devil. And watch God do his best. Because if all bets are on God, then all bets are good. Listen, ain't nobody on that. Listen. So we're going to go to um, 28 and 29. Same chapter. After this, Jesus knowing that all was now finished, it was fulfilled the scripture. He said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there so that the sponge was filled with sour wine um, 
on a hyssop branch and they held it to his mouth when jesus had received the sour wine he said it is finished and he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit and many have gave controversy con controversy on what he said when um he said it is finished because before he said this he said um i'm gonna probably tear up how it's pronounced but i gotta say it how he said it um actually i have it right here because a lot of people say different things when it comes to it hold on y'all Mm, 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 mm. I'm going to get there really quick. I know the regular version, but I want to say it in the version that they said, which I'm probably going to mess it up if I don't find it. Hold on. <gasps> I need to get organized. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to probably mess up the, the pronunciation of it, but he said, Elohi, Elohi, Lama Sabanti. Which means, my God, my God, why have, thou, why have thou forsaken me? And God didn't forsake him. He knew that God never left him. He knew that God was with him. But he felt the spirit of God leave him because he was ascending away from earth. So he felt empty. It wasn't that God left him. The spirit of God was leaving him because he was getting ready to elevate. And he was still, you know, he was, he did, he never wanted to leave us. He never wanted any of this to happen. And he asked him, you know, like, God, if this is your will, take this cup from me. But he, he said, nevertheless, let your will be done. He was obedient to the T. He never wanted us. He really, you know, Jesus was really rooting for us. And, you know, when you put your faith in man, it will fail you time and time again. But just like Moses they didn't listen to him and they didn't listen to Jesus either but Jesus never wanted any of this to happen but God's will he said nevertheless let your will be done and then he come over to here when he resurrected and when they when they went to the temple when they went to the temple before I go there let me go to before they get to the temple because I'm, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself really quick so before they get to the temple right I'm gonna pull this out because I'm gonna come back to that before they get to the temple they had this thing where they were breaking the legs of um they broke the legs of when they when they pierced jesus right nail through nail through nail through the feet or whatever before the sabbath day they came in and they broke the legs of everyone that was on the cross when they got to jesus they did they figured he was already dead so they didn't break his legs but they pierced his side and when they pierced his side out spat blood and water because jesus said that he was the living water if you think, drink from his well, you will never thirst again. When they pierced his side, they saw the truth. And they were amazed. Like, yeah, yeah, y'all messed up. Y'all really persecuted an innocent man. Y'all really killed a man that came to die for y'all sins. Y'all really killed the living water. When they pierced Jesus' side, water and blood flew out. Flow out. It, it flooded out of him. Like, y'all really killed somebody that had no sin that really came to love y'all listen listen so then it came down to this is where I'm gonna close it with and it's in um, Luke no it's in Mark right it's Mark the very last chapter and it said go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord has spoken unto them, he was received up into the heaven and set at the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord was working with them and confirming the word with signs following them. Listen. The sheer obedience of Jesus Christ has set us all free. One who never knew sin came and died for our sins that we may enter into the kingdom of heaven. The true testament of love showed with grace and poise in the face of those who hated him. He taught us to turn the other cheek 
And above all else, love those that love co covers a multitude of sins. He always knew that he would be betrayed by those who loved him. But in spite of that, he still chose love. He lived 33 years and did miracle signs and wonders, always being about his father's business. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. He rose again in three days. Not only did that synagogue fall down, he rose again so that we can have everlasting life as long as we believed in him. God is not dead. He is surely alive and he lives inside of us. He lives inside of me and he lives inside of you. So we must go out and tell the world about he who has risen that lives inside of you, lives inside of me. I'm just a nobody in closing. I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. We're going to be betrayed. We're going to be betrayed by any and everybody that doesn't believe in God. And we're going to be betrayed by the ones closest to us. But no, everything has a divine purpose. And you're not going to ever think like the per people that are persecuting you and betraying you think. Because you're not like them. You're never like them and you never will be. Everyone has their own divine purpose. And yours is so that you go out and tell the world about this man named Jesus Christ. The man that can change a life. The man that died for our sins. He who had no sins, who took on our sins. And God is saying, he has risen. And I understand that betrayal happens. And I know that people, places, and things do not believe in you. But as long as you walk with Jesus, you're going to be persecuted just like him. And after you have suffered a while, you will rise again. And after today, your suffering ends. It is finished. Jesus rose again on the third day so that we can have life and life that we may live more abundantly. Today, it is finished. It is finished. No more poverty. No more lack. No more persecution. No more vehicles acting stupid, no more jobs betraying you, no more houses, no more financial ruins. Today I call on Elohim, El Shaddai, El Elyon, Jesus of Nazareth. I call on him and I say, God, we are your children. Rise up and use us. Rise up and get your glory. Rise up and get your children. We are your people. We know that you are not dead, but you are surely alive and you live in us. Use us as your body. Use us as your body of Christ to get your glory. Use us, God. We are willing. We are your willing vessels. Use us every single day. It is finished, God. It is finished. It is finished. Heavenly Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right now, God, I ask that everyone that is going to touch this video now and everyone that is under the sound of my voice and as I post this video later, everyone who touches this video, may they be healed, may they be blessed, may they be favored, may they have your love, your power, your glory, your vindication. May they, and I understand, I know the pain of the persecution, the pain of the betrayal is never easy, Father God. I understand this, Father God, I know. But may, they, may you give them your strength. And just like you told Joshua, be strong and be of good courage.